Hello, and welcome to APRA AMCOS Songwriter Speaks, coming to you from the beautiful Mary's Underground in Sydney's CBD. Before we start, I'd like to acknowledge the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation as the traditional and ongoing custodians of the land from which we film today, whose sovereignty was never ceded, and pay my respects to their elders past, present, and future. I'm so excited that our two guests have made the time to be here today. They are both complete powerhouses. On my right is Milan Ring. Milan is a singer, rapper, guitarist, producer, uh, mix and mastering engineer who is meticulously involved with every single stage of the songwriting process from start to finish. Dubbed the Princess of R&B by Apple Music, Milan's music is a beautifully executed blend of organic harmony and digital sounds. If you've ever had the pleasure of seeing her live, she switches between multiple instruments, tri triggering samples and beats, uh, all the while holding down a lyrical flow and or a vocal melody. It's really impressive to watch. <laughs> Milan has sold out shows in Sydney and Melbourne, played Splendor in the Grass, and can boast studio sessions with artists such as DRAM, uh, the Social Experiment, Laven Kali, and a whole bunch more. Um, aside from her songwriting, Milan has led numerous workshops for female identifying non-binary uh, and black indigenous and POC artists. Uh, as well as that, Milan has also recently um, had some stints doing music direction for artists such as Ziggy Ramo, Be Becca Hatch and Be Wise. Milan, thanks so much for making the time to join us today. Thanks for having me. Next to Milan is Vince Goodyear better known by his moniker, 18-year-old man. Vince is an ARIA award-winning singer, songwriter, producer, collaborator, and multi-instrumentalist. He has co-written and produced for many artists, including most recently Triple One, uh, US production duo Take a Day Trip, and Kaite, with whom he wrote and produced the song Miss Shiny, which went on to win an ARIA for Best R&B Song. Under his moniker, 18-year-old man, he's produced a number of singles, including his most recent single, Fireflies, which evokes a neo-soul experimentalism reminiscent of Moses Sumney and Kelsey Liu. Aside from his own songwriting, Vince has composed music for documentaries and podcasts, including ABC's Little Yarns, which explores the diverse stories, languages, and countries of Indigenous Australia. He's also just come off a week-long uh, workshop run by Mad Proper Deadly, where they took a bunch of mobile studios around and did some sessions uh, with people around Armadale. Yeah. yeah, thanks for joining us, Vince. Thank you, very happy to be here. All right, so let's start off um, at the beginning. I guess that makes sense. Um, I'm interested to know what kind of role music played in your early lives. Milan, maybe, do you wanna start with that? Sure, how early are we going? <laughs> as early as you can remember. Uh, okay, um, well, my mother was a dancer, so I grew up, I don't know, I think from the womb she was playing music and um, there's definitely like home videos of me just dancing to like Stevie and Michael Jackson. She predominantly played um, music, like African-American music, jazz, soul, blues, then later kind of went into neo-soul when I was about like four or five, um, you know, mid to late 90s. Um, so yeah, that's definitely like the foundations of music in a huge influence. And I think, you know, as to why I make the music I do, which is obviously heavily influenced by African-American music. Yeah, awesome. Mm. Uh, and Vince, how about you? You, as far as I know, you played in a metal band as a kid. Is that right? <laughs> yeah, it's true. Um, yeah, I, I sort of started my first kind of music, like playing music for me was in metal and like punk metal, kind of anything that's like, you know, crazy like that. And then that was probably from about 15 to 16. And then I sort of didn't do music till, till I was about 22, maybe, or 20, 23 even. I started playing, I saw like a, um, it was just when D'Angelo had like come back and like there was all these like YouTube videos like circulating of him playing keys. Oh yeah, was that uh, Black Messiah? Or yeah, yeah. yeah. Like, oh no, 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 Bef before. before oh yeah. Well, yeah, there was okay. like these like 
you know, hour long videos of him just playing keys, doing the things. And I never heard of him either. Um, and it like fully rocked me. And I got into his music and then kind of like worked my way backwards um, and, you know, found all that music. Because up until then, it was a lot of like just not that. So it was cool. Cool. That's an yeah. interesting pivot. Yeah, it was, it was really good. Um, so when did you first get an interest in songwriting then? Was it something that like for you happened when you first picked up an instrument or did it come later or what? Mm. Yeah. So I didn't pick up an instrument till I was like year seven, year eight. I picked up the guitar. So I know I started, you know, way back as like a child, but I just think that is feels like the foundations of um, music for me. But yeah, I kind of, um, I've taught myself guitar. I was mainly playing like Nirvana and uh, uh, like Ben Harper and like. All right, okay. I was yeah, like sure. kind of in this just guitar tab world really for years and years and years until. Oh guitar yeah, guitar tabs. Oh ultimate guitar. To just <sighs> totally. Uh, Bob Marley, like obsessed with Bob Marley, like learnt a lot of Bob Marley songs. Um, and then it wasn't until I was about 16, 17, I joined, a, a, I formed a band with a couple of my close mates and we started writing and um, and I wasn't singing yet. Like I was so shy and didn't tell anyone I could sing. But um, eventually when I like mustered up the courage to like sing a little bit over this jam we'd written, I actually had always journaled and journaled a lot in poetry. Um, I think maybe because my nan was a poet, I used to see her write and be around that. I kind of had this like booklets of content to pull from when it came to songwriting time. And then it just sort of flowed from there. So That's really cool. That's yeah. interesting that like the lyrics sort of developed, you know, your like lyrical approach sort of developed even before your, you found your singing it voice. Did. That's, that's it, really cool. It did, yeah. Yeah. Mm. And what about you, Vinny, in terms of when you started songwriting? Was that, you know, around that time that you discovered mm. D'Angelo or earlier? Um, I think, well, yeah, there was a sort of a, as I was going through that period, there was a few bands that were playing in Sydney at the time, like, and I saw them for the first time, like, all in a week. It was, like, Sex on Toast, <laughs> New Venusians, and this uh, band yeah. called Triceratops. Yeah. Which is the maddest band. Yeah, <laughs> with so the tune, auto-tune. Yeah, auto yeah, 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 oh they are God. mad. <laughs> and I saw that, and I was like, fuck, what? Like, I just had no idea that anything like that was, was happening yeah. in Sydney. And I, and I was, like, just determined to just, like, have a go at it. And it was so inspiring to see those bands. Like some of the best players in Australia. Yeah. You know? Yeah. I love that. Really um, I love that you were just directly inspired by what was going on around you as well as much as you were by... Yeah, you know, it was all by chance as well. Like, yeah. I, I didn't... Yeah, it was heaps weird. That's really cool. Yeah. Um, so do you remember the first, like, the first song you ever wrote? Yeah. Vinny, do you want to... <laughs> um, the, f the first, yeah, first actual song was a, um, it was like a birthday song for um, my girlfriend at the time. Oh, nice. Yeah, it, it's sick. It's like, uh, it's like pretty extreme. Just like, it's like a super hectic dance song. <laughs> it's kind of, <laughs> it's pretty funny, but yeah. That was, that Are was you it. singing like Happy Birthday in it? I'm or? singing Happy Birthday. Oh we, got, yeah. we got, it's like, um, yeah, it's, a, it's extreme, like horn section, BVs. Oh, okay, you went in. Wow. Yeah, it was, <laughs> it was on, it was on um, my SoundCloud, but like it got taken down. Oh, wow. Okay, that's pretty Wait, legit. Because of the Happy Birthday copyright? No. Did it no, sound like I Happy think Birthday? My managers were like, you know, <laughs> this is not on brand. <laughs> <laughs> but it's a banger. Maybe I should re, you know, revisit yes, it. Yes, yeah. please. Yeah. yeah. Um, Milan? Um, yeah, I think so. Um, with that band, one of the first songs was called Payday, um, which we ended up recording like a few years later. And um, it was basically about 
losing your job, not being able to pay the rent, like kind of down that path of like self-sabotage, just drinking too much. And then the chorus was like exploration of like pulling yourself out of that. And are you going to keep going down that path or grow? Um, and yeah, funnily enough, like I guess most of my songs are still an exploration of a lot of those themes of um, self-development and growth and um, light and dark and whatnot. Yeah. Yeah, yeah cool. That's really, really yeah. interesting to know. Yeah. Um, so let's fast forward a little bit to nowadays. Um, I'm interested in understanding your current process for writing music. So I think you both have stu your own studio spaces in the inner west of Sydney, right? Mm -hmm. Around the corner from one another. Yeah, right. <laughs> Where, where's your studio? <laughs> um, Addison Road, Marrickville. Bro. I know. I know. This is why. Have you you've not been to each other's We studio? like We've bump into each other all the time. Together. We're like, we're going to have a session. Yeah, right. right. Now is like the, this is crunch this time is now. We're, yeah. we're sitting on a couch. I know. It has you know. to happen. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's yeah. going to happen You heard now. it here first. Um, <laughs> you heard it here first. <laughs> <laughs> Afra's got the inside scoop. Oh, yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. Um, so, yeah, I guess... You get to the studio, you want to write something new, something fresh that you, you know, something from scratch. Um, where do you start? Where do you go? Is there somewhere you sit down, an instrument you pick up first? Or whoever wants to. Yeah, um, it really depends for me. Um, yeah, which is, every day is different. Um, my main instrument is the guitar. That's where I feel the most at home, the most comfortable. But for that reason, I often like to not start there because I kind of like to follow my ears and not go to where my muscle memory wants to go to, you know, because there's a lot of that with um, guitar, I think. Um, and, and, and not going too much into, like, the technical analysis of what I'm playing. Um, but having said that, I often start on guitar too. So <laughs> I don't know. It just depends. But sometimes I, like, jump on. I've got a piano in the studio, so... Um, like I wouldn't call myself a pianist, but I, you know, love to sit there and, and, um, just explore. Um, yeah. Cool. Cool. Is it the same for you, Vinny, or are you? I think so. I yeah. think, um, yeah, I, when I start writing something from scratch, it's, I'm generally trying to keep it like as abstract and unknown as I can does that make sense like yeah like I'm not I'm really trying to avoid thinking about anything right you know uh, and that could be like not using bass sometimes it helps okay because it keeps it um, rootless and sort of you know stuff like that's I, I like to do that's super yeah. interesting I'm yeah. not sure I've ever tried the yeah, Lack so you base. have these weird, like, beds or ideas. Um, sometimes I'll start with, like, a line because I, I really don't – I try not to write in chords a lot mm. to keep the um, – uh, keep it abstract. Mm. So you can write, uh, like, lines and write, like, horizontally. So it's like um, you do, like, one line and then you harmonise that line and then – you kind of get weird chords. That's okay. That's super interesting. You know? Yeah. That's really, yeah. I've never thought about songwriting like that. So do you mean like you'll write a melody or something? Or, or like yeah. you just, yeah, okay. Or like, I just try and not get stuck in anything. As Like, s sometimes I do, but I kind of like that at the moment. Yeah. 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 I've done that kind of thing a little bit with my voice. So sometimes, um, totally. like I've been in the car driving to the studio, not touching my phone wait so i'm walking down the street going to my studio and i voice memo like a melody that comes to my mind and then i'll jump in the door record the melody and then i'll start harmonizing the melody mm. without really knowing like exactly okay am i thinking it's going to go over these chords or am i you know um it's just what harmonies i naturally wanted to do over that melody and then i would probably then jump on guitar and write some chords around it but okay um it is a nice way to kickstart things like i think um starting with melody lines as well yeah right yeah. i'm really interested that for both of you the rhythm section seems to be an afterthought because um you know i guess drums and bass are like the most prominent features of so much music today 
you know, like most music on the radio. And um, it's really interesting to hear that you both kind of start melodically and harmonically first and foremost. But like, what's the process for when you when you have a harmonic, you know, sort of uh, structure for the song? How do you then start bringing percussive elements in? And you know, what's the usual process for that? Well, I think it's really. I don't actually write music with drums a lot. I mainly make just samples, pretty much. But when I even this even with the samples, I think when you're writing the melodies and stuff, you've always got to kind of have the drums in mind, like pivot points, or like it still has to be rhythmic. You know, mm. sometimes like uh, if you make a good enough, or not, not a good enough, but a kind of uh, like a strong rhythmic melody. A strong rhythmic melody. Yeah. All you have to do is just put a fucking kick and a snare, and it's yeah. going to sound like not like that. It's going to sound mm. something, yeah. something different. Mm. It's got all the um, yeah. Yeah, um, and you then you can it or it has all the little. You just have to kind of follow the melody with your hats or like the little bits, you know? <laughs> yeah, yeah, sure. No, I get I get what you're saying. Yeah. Yeah. Um Yeah, for me I I so if I do sometimes I start on drums. Um, but if I do, you know, say for that example, I've put a vocal melody down and I've harmonized it and then I've put some guitar chords around it. I'm obviously doing this in a door to a certain BPM, like I've probably found the BPM to start off with, because I do tend to always uh, like stay on grid, because it's easier, <laughs> I suppose. Um, it feels good, but um, yeah, then I would just pull up some drum sounds and feel it out, tap it out. I'm all about that. So either MIDI drum sounds or, or you know, a VST, like addictive drums I use, or I, yeah, it's mad. Um, or I have also like an analog drum machine, uh, Dr. A80, like an old oh, school yeah, classic, one. Yeah. Um, and I really love, have, I've always got that like, as soon as I walk into the studio, like I just press PowerPoint on, everything fires up. And um, yeah, that drum machine is like plugged into the interface always. And it's just got good classic sounds. Yeah. And it's just nice to have something that like, you don't have to go into the computer, you can just hit bash it basically. I like to be like super, just whack things. Yeah, and that's feel it out. That's cool. <laughs> that kind of leads into something else that I was interested in, um, in terms of you know you just feeling it out because um, yeah. you're both clearly um, very skilled instrumentalists, um, and Thank you. you know with a with a knowledge I, I would have thought with a knowledge of music theory, um, just with that in mind though, like, is your process more intuitive or do you get to points where you're like oh, I know, like, I'm going to drop into, like, a bridge here and, I, you know, this should go to the, like, relative minor or whatever. Do you think that way or is it always just by ear and by feeling? Who's... Take the floor. Okay. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I guess, it, yeah, it's it's... The theory and stuff, having that knowledge, which I I've only have a basic knowledge of that stuff, that's good for articulating yourself with other people in the room. You know, you can, you can kind of... Because mm. you can't be like, oh, it's like this. Thing. Yeah, that's... Speaking the language. Speaking the mm. language, which yeah. is really helpful and, and, you know, quickens things up. Uh, and it's good, good when you get stuck, you know? Yeah. But I think you really want to just go off like some of the music i used to write like at this when i first started is just fucking so crazy like i can never do that again cuz i think i know too much you know like yeah that's interesting like so uh, i try and i try and like 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 it's like um <laughs> it's like you just want to just paint as much as you can yeah and like get get enough down, and then like it's like you just keep going, keep going, and then and then it eventually you're gonna sort of hit um, a kind of hit something where you get stuck. Yeah. And then from there, I kind of just reverse engineer everything and try and like figure out what the fuck 
I did. Yeah. Does I that make sense? That, no, it does make sense. Okay. And I think that's an interesting <laughs> point you make also about when you started writing music and you kind of didn't know what you were doing. So yeah. you were just doing this crazy stuff that now you n kind of understand what you're doing more. You'd, you wouldn't think of that. It's like, yeah. I feel like when you get like, you know, a new piece of gear or something uh, as well, it's kind of like a time to strike because you don't know how to use it and you mm. start using it in all these crazy ways. And then when you yeah. learn how to use it, mm. you start getting limited. I feel it's like it's the same. It's good with arranging too because you can really, the, 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 the theory stuff, you can really just, it becomes more like, um, like people will actually listen to it. Sure. You know? Sure. Or like, you know, a wider or audience. Yeah. Milan, yeah. Like there are times when, um, like I know I want to put like a, f a particular vibe of a progression in the song or start with that maybe. So I suppose that's, you know, harnessing some sort of that, that knowledge. Um, and then there are other times, you know, I surprise myself and, you know, I have to relearn what I did. Basically, once I put it down, I come back and I'm like, oh, I wrote interesting. I, I'm surprised that I went there or I mm. put a key change. Like if I had thought about that, I would I would have been like, no, don't put that kind of key yeah, change. Sure. That doesn't that's a bit odd. But it once I kind of am flowing it um, and just following like. Yeah, my intuition and following the vibe of the moment, then, um, you know, I think that's always the most important thing because I think, like, it's so great to have the, the like, as we were saying, like, the language and, um, but it's not necessary. Like, it's always, the feel is what's the most important thing always. But if you have, you know, both, that can be very useful. And, and it's, like, technical skills. Like, I went to TAFE to study, like, I had a, have a diploma in production and engineering. And then to get those technical skills has really helped me obviously to be the producer and engineer that I am but like as we we're saying in other sessions and being able to articulate what if you you know throw this plug-in in or whatever it may be um so I think it all everything helps everything yeah, <laughs> I don't know yeah. but but um yeah with structures of songs and like bridges and stuff like that you were saying before I think um it is, I think a lot of my songs do follow quite a contemporary uh, format in mm. terms of verses and choruses and bridges and um, for the most part, because um, as much as I do, I love all mu so much music. I love all music and I love things that don't have that set structure. I gra tend to gravitate towards that in my own music yeah. most of the time. Yeah. yeah sure. I think that's... Um that's interesting. I think in my in my own music, uh, I try to. I'm just sort of thinking about some of the some of those songs, and um, they are maybe a bit more like linear, mm. like no, which is interesting, or like experiential or something. Yeah, and okay. that's what's so beautiful. Like your last single totally has that as a journey, and it is a linear journey with like swells and mm. dips um but it doesn't have this like bang verse bang chorus yeah. feel to it um which i really love that, that really kind of brings us to where i want to be right now in terms of uh really focusing in on a couple of your tracks okay. um so i guess for you milan the most recent release of yours is um are your friends all right mm -hmm. uh and vince you've released you released a track a few months ago called fireflies yep. um so if you could take me through the process like start to finish of how those songs came about maybe milan if you want to yeah start off um yeah so are your friends all right i started on bass um i've been starting more and more songs on bass lately because i'm getting more confident with my bass playing um but you know i still just call myself a guitarist yeah. but um yeah, I jumped on bass with that and started those like arpeggiated chords, which start the song, which is like dun 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 dun. dun. Um, and then uh, my memory of it's a bit skewed. So I was in the studio with Blessed, and Blessed was like engineering that one. So he was um, at my studio, so he was set up. I was like playing bass. What do you think of this? Pulled up a tempo. He like started laying down some drums, and then like. It's it's a funny one because 
it's like what I said before about learning my songs after. Because basically how this song went, it was like bass um, with drums and then I put the guitar in and keys. And then later on I put the vocals down. And then basically after I released it, I was like, oh, I, I wonder what it's like to sing and play it at the same time. And I was like, whoa, I can't believe I, I was surprised with myself, pleasantly surprised. Just like big offing myself here. But I went to like a pretty random key change. Um, I kind of go to this like G flat major seven sharp 11 and then go into a different key for the chorus. Um, and I don't remember doing that, but I definitely did it on the day. Um, and yeah, if I was to think about that, like if I was to analyze that and sit there and start to use like my right brain, that wouldn't have happened. That was definitely just me flowing and being like, yeah, let's go here. This sounds cool and let's go here. Um, yeah, so that's how it came together. Yeah, it kind of worked. I don't, it does work. Um, well, you hope so because it's yeah, out. Yeah, it it's definitely out. works. <laughs> <laughs> but um, yeah, that's basically how that went down there. He um, Bless gave me the stems like the end of that day and then I went deeper into the production and um, yeah, uh, wrote the vocals, um, produced those, mixed it, released it. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. That's cool. I didn't know that you'd worked with Blessed on that track as well. That's yeah. sick. Yeah. Cool. Um, and your latest release, Fireflies, do you want to give us a bit of a, a walkthrough of that? Yeah. Yeah. Um, okay. Well, I had the guitar riff and I just, that was the first thing. And I recorded that and kind of had that for like, like two months, I think. I just kept playing it. It's like one of those things you just just keep playing. Like those, you know, those things that you just play for ages. Yeah. Um, and then I recorded some BVs over it, um, and it was originally just going to be like a sample for someone for someone else. And then I put what happened? Then I then I did the first bit. Just that like intro sequence, uh, and then I had like intense writer's block for like for like six months. Yeah, wow. I had like the whole, I had like the drums in and stuff, but just up into that where the drums come in, and then it was um, just couldn't quite get lyrics down. Um, yeah, it was really intense. It was just like so hard. So how did you eventually get well, like over that? Mm. I just f forced, like I guess what now is like the chorus or whatever. I mean that's that's the only little bit I could get out of, and I wasn't really very happy with it. Right. Uh, oh. And uh, that's why I put all the strings in, just because I couldn't. I just couldn't fucking write anything. So, so you recorded like. What was this? Was a string quartet, or how did that go? How um, well, that was. How many string players? So it lush. was just it was Billy's br younger brother, uh -huh. uh, and his older brother. Okay. So two. So two. Yeah, it sounds so beautiful the way that they're layered. Thank you. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. You raised an interesting point though, which Milan. Do you um, suffer from writer's block ever? And like, if you do, how do you get past that? If you come to a stop in a song. Yeah, I I don't love the phrase and I don't tend to use it sure. I, because I sort of listen to myself. I think, you know, life is in seasons and cycles and that can be throughout a day or throughout the whole year. And I notice there are times that I don't have any more to give. I don't have any output and I know that's okay. I just need to soak it all up. Like I've used this analogy before. It's not the most glamorous analogy, but being like a sponge and once you're like all squeezed out, you need to, you know, soak up all the water mm. again. Um, and so that's what I do. So yes, I go for big periods without writing. Um, I'm still being musical though in that time, but it doesn't necessarily mean I'm 
Um, I'm very, I take big breaks between lyrics, like and melodies, like some, that's very, cause that's very like direct kind of personal, um, exploration, right? You know, um, but I tend to be doing, I'm like, okay, I'm not feeling like writing right now, like down to play guitar for other people at the moment or MD stuff, you know, mm -hmm. be m musical in that way. I'm still going to like jam on guitar, like go over my jazz standards like this year like in lockdown when I wasn't feeling like writing anything like lyrically or anything fresh I was like I'm gonna visit the Stevie Wonder song book and like oh, nice. learn some Stevie songs yeah so I tend to do things like that as well as like watching like performances listening to music reading like literature and and yeah. you know audiobooks and yeah so I just do that for a while and then eventually one day I'm like, blah, here's all this yeah, music. Yeah, sure. I also yeah. think that I love that. That's mad. That's <laughs> very cool. And it, uh, like non-musical things can be musical. Like the negative space of when you're not doing music 100%. is music. Yeah. Like I love that. Going for a yeah. walk in the park or like fucking, I don't know. Going to the IMAX or something, you know, like doing stuff. <laughs> the that IMAX. Yeah, <laughs> R.I.P. <laughs> Wait, people go to the IMAX? That's such a random reference. That's great. <laughs> I'm just really excited it's getting built. Um, oh, right. Yeah. I was like, it's but around. You know, doing, doing, yeah. doing, yeah, doing yeah. things, doing, doing things that, that like, um, yeah, because I feel like sometimes I see like a lot of this sentiment on, uh, you know, Instagram or producer stuff where it's like, if you're not going 110%, then fucking why are you even doing it? Sort of energy. And it's like, you got to, you know, 100, what are the thing like, million hours makes, you know, you just got to work, 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 and you'll get there. But I think actually, it's 10,000. 10,000. A million. You've oh, made yeah. it really hard for yourself. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I think there's actually so much value in, like, balance and not, like, anyway. Yeah, totally. oh, that's a really refreshing yeah. sort of outlook, I think. Because um, it's it's through our, you know, music comes through our bodies, so we'll be mm. looking after of many elements, you know, our minds, our bodies, you know. If, if mm. you're, like, just going too hard, you know, you're going to burn yourself out. And I think often writer's block comes from burnout, and uh, both, like, physically, emotionally, spiritually... So what do you need to do? You need to go and explore and be in nature and go to the IMAX. <laughs> yeah, go to the IMAX. That's if you. <laughs> um, yeah, so I guess that kind of links into another thing I wanted to ask you, um, just about where you find inspiration to to write. Is it by listening to other people's music, or is it from you know going for like a nice walk in nature, or like uh, you know, thinking about particular concepts, you know, political or literary or, you know, where, or is it just innate? Like, where, where's most of your inspiration come from? Hmm. <laughs> 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 you first. Uh, where does inspiration, I mean, yeah, as we said, like, absolutely everywhere. I, you know, I love, particularly in terms of my own music and, um, lyricism and and the approach the overarching like theme of themes of my music um i am very inspired by philosophy psychology and learning more about that world of things um anything in particular like that you would want to share like what in, uh, philosophy like what kind of or like i know? well i've read a little bit about a few different philosophies yeah. like there's so much more to read but sure. um you know, adlerian um philosophy like stoic hermetic philosophy but and i really like like reading some books by like, don miguel ruiz at the moment like um and you know like eckhart tolle's like about being present and you know controlling our critical mind because i think as as creatives we really have that going hard yeah, um sure. so that kind of thing for sure because I, but a lot of my music explores like themes of mental health um depression addiction control obsession um 
uh, I don't know. I think I'm just always fascinated by, you know, obviously things I've experienced as well as observed um, from and from my journey, like till now, um, and why we are the way we are mm. as humans, and like that 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 interests me, and you know that critical mind, like that whole dialogue, that just really interests me. Like so, I. I'm inspired by that. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> cool. And Vinny, you, how about you? Um, it's kind of hard to say because I guess I kind of go to the studio pretty much almost every day and I, so like when I'm in there, sometimes it's, um i'm gonna make stuff if if i'm when i'm when i'm not inspired or if, you know just, regardless just like yeah either way like I what don't know. It's inspires more of you a instinct or oh something. great like okay. i just there's nothing really I, I, I yeah i'm not sure if i can really um put into words what makes me want to make music yeah I definitely get great peace when I'm making, like, the process of actually doing it Yeah, is very calming to my my mind. So I think I want, I, I'm, like, addicted to that. Yeah. Uh, in terms of, like, themes and stuff in my own music, I often will write... Like, in a really, I mean, I don't know, I've never really talked to anyone about this, but um, a way where I'll just write down random words and, like, the song, like, it'll just be, like, it literally have no meaning at all. And then I'll just have, like, I'll read about, like, mountains and stuff and, like, and then I'll kind of have these lyrics that like just don't mean anything. And then it's like a coloring in book and I'll just like put in my own like spine in it. No way. And then, <laughs> That's but so it, cool. I, I know it sounds really like, um, uh, like, what's the word? Fucking like uh, it cold or calculated. But after a while, like when I read it back, not the first time, but as I read it back more and more times, it becomes very, very, um, special to me and personal which is strange am i does that sound weird no yeah i think it sounds kind of like it's a trigger point for you to just then express yourself like openly without yeah. having like right it's like Maybe, a little yeah because it's always the hardest when you're like you just feel like such a loser like you know on the paper like <laughs> i feel sad or something. Uh, yeah right. <laughs> or like you know like writing writing really putting yourself out there so i yeah. think maybe that's a kind of you can use it as a guise and then like you just put in it's like you've got the form you just like write your name at the top and it's like a mad song that's sort of <laughs> really interesting technique yeah I'd yeah i would never have thought of that um so following on from that and it sounds like you both have like quite i don't know you you know you your way of writing is kind of innate and like sort of comes from it's like less just into intellectual, I guess it's like more just from feeling and like you letting sort of things flow out of you. Um, bringing it back to musical influences, um, which you've both touched on, you know, some of the influences that you've had over the years. Um, I don't know if you've seen, there's like a really cool interview between Pharrell Williams and Rick Rubin on YouTube. Have you, either of you seen that? It's, it's worth watching. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, he looks like, kind of looks like Jesus, you know, he's now yeah. he's like retired or like, you know, kind of older. Um, and they're just sitting in Rick Rubin's backyard on the grass, um, just at a table, and they're asking each other questions. And Pharrell, um, yeah, it's really cool. And um, uh, so, um, yeah, Pharrell's talking about the moment where you hear a song for the very first time and it just stops you, you know, you just really connect with it and you stop and you just soak it in. Um, and he says he does two things. 
the first thing is obviously like find out what it is so he can just go and listen to it again and again and understand it. And the other thing is he'll try to remember the exact feeling that it gave him on first listening and try to internalize that so he can go back to the studio and reverse engineer that exact feeling and put it into a piece of his own music. Um, I'm interested if something like that's ever happened to you, you know, where you've just loved a song so much that you're like, I, I have to do something like this. And you've, you know, can you think of a, a song that you've listened to and that's happened to you? Um, yep. Yeah. <laughs> um, something like, I remember hearing, uh, you know, Juni? That's Solange's song. Uh. It's like, um, you know, when it's like, starts with the. Which. <laughs> I just, I'm so bad with names of songs. Oh, uh, it's, it's like... You played it. Um, yeah, that's definitely had an effect. And also, Surf, that album, which Milan... Mm. You're, you played on that album, right? No. Oh, you didn't? didn't no. Okay. What, what's, the, what's the album? Surf. This album, Surf... Yeah. Um, by The Social Experiment. By The Social oh, okay, Experiment. Sure. Like, mm. fully... Um, changed my perspective on music and yeah. mixing and um, yeah I think it's yeah cool what about yeah. it exactly it's yeah. just like super turbo like <laughs> like really it's like kind of like technical death metal of soul you did know? you yeah. listen to their the intellectual album oh my god I'm on that are album you, really? that that's that that's like of head fuck oh. even more it's amazing i it's love intellectual those guys turbos are really great it's like word. sonic the hedgehog and soul <laughs> yes you know it's like i love that yeah yeah it's like um <laughs> those guys and i i was actually unbelievably uh had a session with nate fox and oh cool um some other those other such guys such legends such legends Good people. And, yeah, that music is so cool and so original. It's yeah. not for everyone because it's, like, very in your face and, like... Yeah. And they're, ver they're very, like, um, musically intelligent yeah. there as mm. well. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. Mm. Um, it comes through. So, c yeah, coming back to that, like, you know, idea of a song that you just mm. love and you just, you know, I guess try to reverse engineer, you think about it and... I don't know if I've uh, the reverse engineering mm -hmm. thing like oh that's super interesting I, I'm not sure if I've exactly thought of it like that um and it happens all the time so much music I listen to I'm just like oh yes but what's just popped in my head is um maybe like a year or two years ago or something when I listened to The Color Is Anything by James Blake and I hadn't listened to his like um, previous records really or anything like that I kind of it was just so like heartbreaking <laughs> just got me like it really got me um but in such a beautiful way and it was like such a beautiful release and I was like oof yes I want to make music that makes me feel like that you know and um of course it's not gonna make everyone feel like that everyone has their own experience but um I love that that release in, in music and not that, um, of course there's like, not all my music is going to be super melancholy. Every, um, there's space for different shades, but probably like my favorite songs of mine are the ones that like fucking break my heart. Yeah, <laughs> definitely. Agree, yeah. Um, I don't know what that says about me, but yeah. because it's like, it's my release, like it's my exploration, it's my healing mm. and I'm like, Oh, you were in pain, but you got it out. Yeah. And now you're all right. <laughs> you're doing it. Yeah, totally. It. And James, James Blake is pretty good at that. Yeah, I mean, um, yeah, it's just pulling at the heartstrings, yeah. you know, that whole vibe. Um, yeah. So with that in mind, do you think it's ever possible to be a songwriter and just a passive listener of music? Or are you always listening to music being like, oh, that's cool, maybe I could use that? Um you know, in my own practice. Do you think it's it's possible to disengage the two? Go on. <laughs> your mic was closer to your mouth. <laughs> um, 
I think maybe because I got started, ma- you know, really playing music at a later age. Yeah. I I can kind of switch between the two two minds. You know, I can enjoy. I yeah, I can think, listen to it, and love it. Mm. But something I don't know if you've heard this in my mind, but like. I don't really like listen to music. Oh, ever. <laughs> what do you mean? <laughs> <laughs> it's so fucked. I know. Cool. Um, like I barely listen to any music. Like I haven't listened to any new music for the last. I don't know. Is that strange? Wow. Well, like um, I know. It's, uh, no, it's yeah. What do you mean by that? Strange. Like, I've definitely yeah. had <coughs> breaks, and especially if you're in a lot of output, like you don't really want so much input because it's going to affect your output. Right? Yeah. yeah I oh, just, true. I, I guess I, I just. Don't, I mean, I listen I to. I kind of listen to the refs of s- things that people send me in the morning yeah. when I g- go for my walk. So and what do you do? Then you I listen, listen to anything. You I listen, listen to the music I make, and then I listen to the mixes on the way home. And then yeah, right. It. It's really sad. <laughs> but I think is that so common? Sad. Is that common? I uh, think that would be very common. Yes. Um, but. But I definitely listen to music. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I like seeing live music. Just yeah, yeah. I yeah. mean. That's the ultimate. And I guess there's yeah. been a big void of that this year. Mm. Yeah. No, live music is like, oh, of course, it's like so important um, to see and feel yeah. energetically. Um, oh, my gosh. What was the question? Yeah. No, no. That's um, So basically <laughs> I was asking about, like, do you think it's possible to be a songwriter and just passively listen to music? And Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. The passive thing. Um, yeah, for sure. And I don't know why the passive sounding like, is there a negative connotation no, no, there? there? Or yeah, is I know it, yeah. how <laughs> it might sound like. I guess what I'm, what I'm um, the line of thinking is like, when you're listening to music, are you always thinking, oh, cool, that's, that sounds so sick. I could use that in, in one of my own tracks, you know, like. Yeah, yeah. I think that comes up for mm. sure. Um but at the same time, like, I can just put stuff on and I'm not thinking about it at all. Because yeah. I, I put music on when I'm cooking and I'm just, like, yeah. dancing around. But then maybe there'll be, like, I'll be like, ooh, like, love that synth sound or, yeah. or something. Um, so it's, I feel like it's such an amazing thing being a musician and being able to go deeper and, like, be able to kind of be, like, further inspired by mm. those things. Like, um, it's... Like, it's so exciting when you hear, you know, I don't know, I don't know, even like vocal production or something, like just being inspired by those, whatever you're listening to. I feel like, yeah. I'm not explaining myself very well. I so I just don't go too deep to like microanalyze it. That's rare that I do that unless I'm like learning the song. But there's definitely things that like spark. If it's a mad song, you're not going to think about it. You know, yeah, that's, that's the other thing too. Yeah, okay. yeah, yeah, I, yeah, sure. yeah, unless like you consciously like yeah. pull it up in the studio because you're like, this is a reference. What have they done? That's um, also, I think that's also kind of what I'm asking. Mm. Like, um, can you think of a time when you've been so into something and you've been like, okay, I'm gonna use that. You know, that's like a direct, for sure, directly inspires me. Yeah, I actually, I'm not gonna tell you the artist. Because if I put it out, what if it sounds similar? Uh. <laughs> Breaching copyright. Sorry, Apra. Uh. Um, no, no, no. I'm not. But what I, I actually did recently was pull yeah. in a song that I, I really loved. Um, I haven't done this before. And it's not released, but we'll see what happens. But my song's not released. Anyway, I pitched it down a little bit. And I changed the tempo. And I grabbed a section that I loved, like this piano section I loved. And, like, looped that up. And then I grabbed the guitar and I replayed it. I changed a chord, like changed the inversion, played a, a beat over the top, deleted it, and it's like such a nice song. But like, wow. it doesn't sound like the original, but I'm like, oh, does it a little bit? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I mean, like sample, replay. I have not done that very much. It was. People. That's oh, cool. It was really make, like, yeah. it really opened me up. Like, it was really, really cool. But yeah, then it's I. Cool. It's yeah. Like a it's like a frame in a house, and then like you build a house and it gets framed up. It's like a new thing. Exactly. Yeah, yeah, frame in a house. That's a good. That's a good analogy. I like that. <laughs> um. <laughs> yeah, I use that one all the time. Yeah. <laughs> no, I do. 
Um, okay, so um, Dev Hines, who, you know, Blood Orange um, is his current moniker. Um, who Milan, I think you've mentioned in the past, is an artist that you quite like. Um, Absolutely love him. Yeah, yeah so good. And um, Vince, I think you've kind of been... Um, <laughs> I've actually never heard of Blood Orange song. Oh, you haven't? You haven't heard... Yeah, because that's funny, because I, I read would a love, review... I think you would love... Yeah, I read a review that compared you to Blood Orange, um, which was... Yeah, interesting. Um, but so he's, um, you know, he's kind of writes pop music, but he's also interested in like minimalist classical music and avant-garde composition and everything. Mm. And one of his um, go-to techniques is he loves to walk through New York City with like a field recorder or like his iPhone and just record the sounds of the street. And then when he gets back to the studio, he just teases out a melody from like just the sounds of like street performers or like mm. people talking. And I think it's a really sort of romantic and way to, to come up with um, music. And I was wondering if you have any like secret weapons or like weird techniques, abstract techniques like that that you use mm. when writing music. Yeah, I love that. Um, well, I recently made a beat around a voice memo um, that was like, I had this voice memo um, that I found from when I was in Cuba a few years ago. And it was just like the general kind of street hustle bustle and then there was like a street vendor like calling out and he was like in in a particular pitch the whole time and then I like built a beat around that I guess similarly but then it's so embedded in the beat now you yeah. can't even hear it but um but that's interesting I didn't know that's what Dev did there but um other yeah. strange techniques um oh do you have some strange techniques <laughs> I sort feel of like unconventional. Yeah. Sometimes, unconventional. well, when I'm working by myself, I'm generally working in like six different sessions, and I'm like cycling, like cycling through them. Oh wow! Like really qu quickly at the one time. Yeah. Okay. Like, um, so I'll just listen through it, and then I can change it, and then I'll just open another song up. Um, yeah. So yeah, that's helpful. It gives you fresh ears and kind of. Um, Do you mean like six different? Songs. Songs, wow. Yeah. They're only samples. Like yeah, yeah. Not like full songs, but ideas. Mm. Yeah. Um, okay. And that can, you can just tell immediately if it's good, like what's working and what's not. And then you kind of just work them all together. It's really, it's cool. And they mm. kind of bleed in, like they bleed into each other. Like the, I don't know. Yeah, yeah. Um, that's always interesting. You can't really do that with other people in the room though. Yeah, you're driving just like, crazy. What the fuck are you doing? Yeah. <laughs> I do that um, a little bit, maybe not so intensely, but um <laughs> so so many. But like I definitely get like a bit like I uh, maybe I'll work on a song for like half an hour and I'm like, oh okay, next, yeah. next now. Yeah. And then um yeah, to kind of keep momentum. I don't like to be momentum. um don't like to stall for too long. Like I like mm. to just keep flowing. So I get that. Yeah, that's okay. cool. Another one is the pit, like changing the pitch of the song. I love doing that. Yeah. Oh, yes. It's a, it's, it's bad. Yeah. I just like love changing the pitch. Making it a bit wonky. Yeah. yeah. Uh, and you can hear, you can generally, it's like hearing it for the first time. Mm. You get that, you get like, what is it? Eight goes. Yeah. Um, to kind of hear it and be like, as someone who's heard it for the first oh, time. Oh, eight mm. goes. Is that... I mean, no, I'm just joking. Oh, right. Like eight, <laughs> eight, like eight keys or whatever. some kind of theory. Yeah, There's right. more than eight keys, is there? <laughs> <laughs> I, I like to... Um, sometimes if I'm, like, really out... Like... If I, I'm not feeling jumping on a particular instrument and I just kind of want the computer to help me out a bit, I... Ableton has like this scale feature and chord feature. So you can basically, I really love this because um, I'm, you know, not a keys player, but I love playing keys and I love coming up with lines on keys and kind of soloing. But then like, if it's in a different key, then I have to think too much about like, oh, don't hit that black note or whatever it may be. So if you just chuck this scale feature, you can put any scale, this is like a lo long list of scales, put it, set it to a particular key, and then I'm just like jamming. Because yes. uh, no matter what I mm. press, it's not going to be wrong. Cool. Like yeah. th some of the notes are doubled. But then I'm just kind of, I really love that because then I can just flow um, 
without having to think about oh, it. Yeah, for sure. I, I love shit like that. And then you can also chuck then a chord um, emulator on top. So then every like note you press is a chord, mm. but within the scale. Yeah, wow. So that it, and then you can print that to MIDI again, and then like change the inversions and stuff if sure. you want to go in and like fuck it up a bit. Yeah. So I like doing that. I've been doing that a bit more just to kind of get me out of like it's so easy for me to like fall into similar things on guitar totally. uh, but also at the same time to go very wacky on guitar because i know that i like kind of doing that because it's a bit i don't know I, it's just I a different a, way I it's like a, a little fun trick yeah for, for you go on <laughs> um just when you're talking about like the melody piano stuff i was wondering mm -hmm. uh the song is it unbounded yes in the in the start it's an old song <laughs> it's very hectic song. At Thank the you. start, yes. Did you I write the melody, the vocal melody on uh, piano first? Because it really reminds me. It's like so amazing and really musical. It's like Esperanza Spalding kind of rhythm and mel and like harmony. It's so cool. Thank you. Um, I. Uh, that's written with a piano player called Marcello Mayo and he sent me the piano and then I wrote all the vocals on top cool. and produced the drums on top and stuff like that. Yeah. So, Some of the so that's lines and then how, oh, the, oh, the intro, intro, yeah, yeah, yeah. right? Yeah, 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 yeah. And like the lines cross over the bar and it's like, yes. Yeah, so he'd written that. He and then I just I followed his melody, yeah, like to a T, and wrote the lyrics, um, to that. Wait, what's it called in jazz? There's a term for it. It's escaped me. Where you, oh, a lot of like famous jazz um, standards, you know, that have a particular horn line, vocalists have then gone and put lyrics to. Oh, yeah. I wish I could remember. Yeah. So I've done a little bit of that when I was kind of like exploring a bit of jazz. So I was like, I heard that and was like, I'm following this melody to a T. Um, it, even though added, it's difficult. Added on I added a bit, yeah. Cool There's a definitely parts, added a bit yeah. to like flow them. Thank you. Yeah, I forgot about that. There you go. Cool. Um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, very, very good. The production is out of control. It's <laughs> like I've never heard a song like that ever. Thank you. Wow. Thanks. Should listen to it again. I forgot it. Listen to it today <laughs> on the walk hits. Oh. It's mad. <laughs> Legend. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So so far, this conversation's been pretty like solo, studio centric, I guess. Um, and you both collaborate with other people. Um, so I wanted to dive into that a little bit. Um, Vinny, maybe let's talk about. You know, you've done a bunch of production for other artists. Most recently on the debut triple one album that just came out recently which is really sick um thank you yeah do you want to tell us a bit about that process working with other people yeah um well yeah the triple one was a really good one it was sort of my first time working with them and yeah, I, I knew them a little bit, but but not heaps. Uh, and I had, we had like four days set f for writing. And I would maybe consider myself like a quiet person, or like you know reserved maybe. Uh, but I think when when music's in involved, I kind of like get. I don't know, like energy or something from that. So when I was there with those guys, we we made, it was pretty amazing actually. We made, every day we made a song on the album and finished it. Sick. Yeah, it was pretty crazy. I actually had this like, I had worries like each night, like I would go to sleep like, like is it gonna, when's it gonna run out, you know? <laughs> um, and yeah, I don't think it was so consistent and free and I think that's to do with, you know, the people in the room, they're, they're kind of like a genreless band and they're kind of quite um, open and free musically. So 
Um, That's awesome. Did you start like? Oh, sorry if I've cut off your no, train no, of no, thought. No, 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 no. It was very much closed. Did, <laughs> <laughs> did you start? Um, do you often start with like? Because I know you make a lot of kind of back beds and like samples and stuff. Did you start yeah. like that, or did you start from scratch? From scratch. One? That's awesome. And like. There's always that feeling, you know, when you go into a session and like, you know, you know, and like everyone's there and like you're like, so like what's the song? And you're like, you're just playing this thing and then in the back of your mind. Dance monkey. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and you just sort of like feel like you're not really sure if everyone's vibing and like, you know, you know that thing and you're just playing it. It's like, so, like you do all, it's so funny. You're like you, Everyone's talking, have a good time. And then once, once you're writing, there's, it's just silence. And mm. everyone's in silence listening to this like thing you've done on repeat yeah it can be kind of like um it's pretty funny really uh um fuck, i don't even know where i've gone with this but i guess in that environment i was able to any idea any idea i had they were just so open to go down as far as we could take it and cool. i think that's how we had some really like different sounding songs on the album yeah, great. Uh, and I also got to fulfill like all of my emo fantasies. On yes, guitar, <laughs> which is really good. <laughs> well, that's awesome. Um, yeah. yeah, and with that in mind, it's like working with people or taking music to a, a different context. Um, I saw recently you did a one of those Mary's live sessions from the Lansdowne, I think, um, of Are Your Friends All Right? And you had a, a band mm -hmm. for that. Um, do you ever find that you write a piece of music and then you take it? to the band or, or to a like live setting and all of a sudden it flips your perception of it and you know does that kind of thing happen to you or? for sure I am um, I mean I don't think I've done that for a very maybe since the very first band I was in with an unreleased song sure uh oh or so, uh, I definitely have for soon to be released songs well for example like at the moment I have a show coming up in like two weeks now and I'm doing it with a full live band mm. and um, I've been emptying that. We're about to go into rehearsals and it is like, I mean, we haven't started the rehearsals yet, but it definitely, even just me conceptualizing the whole thing has like brought this new life into all the songs. And um, I love that about live because you can really just rip it apart and change it and, and kind of fuck with like the, you know, the form like i i do that a lot like i don't necessarily follow um verse chorus bridge how it came out in its neat little three and a half minute package i can kind of expand it and like i'm like this would be great for like a key solo here or this would be really beautiful to have like a drum like bass kind of breakdown feature here um i i get really excited about uh, flipping that and a few songs like I've I've reharmonized, I've changed the chord progressions um, for the live setting. Um, so yeah, I think like sky's the limit. You can really take it anywhere, and it's really. Um, I, I think also, and like when I do MD stuff as well, like not only for my own stuff. It's really about like also engaging the right musicians and playing to their strengths too. Yeah, like okay. I'm not going to tell, uh, I don't know. I can't even think of a, uh, an idea. Yeah. <laughs> like you're not going to book like a, just a classical pianist and get them to play like a particular different genre that sure, they're not comfortable yeah, yeah. with. Obviously yeah. that's like an extreme, but even in terms of like the band that I've um, booked for this gig coming up, um, which is slightly different to the um, Mary's one. Um, like, they're just such incredible musicians and I just really love to give everyone, like, their own free reign at times too. Like, yeah. I'm always going to be, like, looking at the overarching and, like, um, thing and make sure it doesn't get too out of where I want it to go. Yeah. Of, of, course. of course. But, like, that's really exciting to me because, as yeah, it totally breathes a new life yeah. into who's the song. Who's in the band? Who's in the band? <laughs> <laughs> um, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, no, for sure. There's um, Droll, Amaru, um, DC on drums, Dom Cabrera. Uh, i got Rissa and McLeat on BBs. Oh, my God. Yeah. 
it's yes. it's um, going to be pretty fucking awesome. <laughs> Such a dream band, so yeah. I'm pretty excited. So I want to bring it back to some more general um, questions about personal identity and uh, I guess just 2020, you know, more generally. Um, first off, I think one thing that affects a lot of artists is this sort of imposter syndrome, like, um, you know, it's all sort of come together, but it's rickety. It could fall apart at any minute and everyone will realise what a big phony I am. Does does that ever happen to you? Like, do you ever feel like, you know, this sense of, um, yeah, you know, imposter syndrome? And if you do, how do you deal with that? Vinny, do you want to speak to that one? Um, yes, I, I had that. I mean, I've had that pretty intensely uh, in the past few years, but it's something I've I've... I think I've definitely kind of gotten better at. But early on, you know, you do like session with someone, you know, like that feeling of going into a room. Like when I was in LA, you know, doing these sessions with people that are just so um, talented and skilled and experienced and you just can't help but feel like why why am I here? Or like what do I have to yeah. offer, you know? Uh and or even just like you know, you, as musicians you always or you know, yeah, as artists you always have it's generally like a, a skill set of like, you know, when you really get it down, it's like, you know, eight or nine things that you can like show and tell. And so you sometimes you worry that like I don't know like those things will run out or someone you know will find that you play the same thing over yeah. things or um, but what I did find when I was in those sessions in LA is that um, so cliche but like you just have to be yourself Cause yeah yeah because if you you know if you try and over play or over be seen or heard, it, people will pick up on that. And mm. authenticity is key. Yeah. And is what makes people connect with music. So it feels like you're going the wrong way when you're in the room with all these, like, fucking sick hunts. But, like, sorry. <laughs> um, but you actually... They, they and the audience yeah. will respect you more if you just follow your heart. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. no, no, I... Yeah. I, I, I I'm with you. No, yeah. 100%. Mm. Yeah, authenticity. Yeah. Totally. You just feel very daunting mm. to put yourself out there because you're worried that people will be like, you know, mm. you suck or mm. whatever. Mm. No, I totally get that. Um, I definitely, like, have had a lot of that in the past. Um, uh, I mean, and in so many different settings, like, I remember the first, like, big band I started playing in when I was like 17, 18 um, was like basically all con graduates and me who's just self-taught on guitar basically and done a few lessons. Um, I felt like an absolute <laughs> imposter, you know, times like that. And then like then playing guitar for other people in the scene for years, that's kind of before I started like writing a lot more. Um, also, yeah, just kind of feeling, I, I, you know, it's, it's a lot of the time it's like, it's just that voice in your head won't shut the fuck up, you know what I mean? And it's, and it's telling you you're not good enough and you're not as good as them and, and you are an imposter and someone's gonna realize you didn't go to the con, hey, he doesn't yeah. actually know what he's doing or whatever. Um, but, you know, once I think the more like work I've done, like self work I've done to like quite quiet in that voice and recognize that, you know, where my strengths are and um, and that, as you said, being like authentic, like as long as I'm authentic to myself, there is no one in the world that is exactly like me. And there's there's something in that. But also it's OK that like maybe I didn't you know, I don't have um that person's technique 
technical yeah. skills or whatever it might be, you know, but there's, there's something else I can give as long as I'm, um, yeah, just like authentic, true to myself, quieting that voice and having like self confidence, I suppose. And I think that's just been, um, yeah, just growing confidence, I think, um, gets rid of that imposter syndrome. Mm. And a good circle of, of friends and team, I think, as well. Yeah, absolutely. 100%. Oh, yeah. You know. Yeah. Totally. Totally. Um, thinking about that, being true to yourself and, um, you know, something I've kind of personally interrogated in the past is this idea of being an artist of colour in Australia. Um and how, in some ways, whether you like it or not, your presence is like inherently political, whether it's overt in your music or not. And it, you know, f when I was growing up, um, I was kind of, you know, I'm from like a mixed race background, I guess, and I was very confused about my identity. And I feel like music was something that I, I really grabbed onto that that helped me in a lot of ways. But you know, in some ways, I used it to shield who I was, but then at other times I'd be like, use it as a reason to make everyone look at who I was. It was like this, you know, tool that was really important as I was growing up in, in this context. Um, and I guess, you know, Vin, as a First Nations man, and Milan, with your, you know, multi-ethnic heritage as well, has music ever had this kind of relationship to you as well? Like, you know, has it served as like an outlet in relation to your identity? Does that make sense, um, question? Or? Yeah, 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 absolutely, yeah. it makes sense. Um, uh, it's just, you know, breaking down what identity is, and there's so many things that form up, form one's identity, and, and part of that is my cultural identity, as well as, you know, growing up in Australia, and, you know, nurture nature, all those kind of totally. things. So. I think 100% it comes through in my music. Um, you know, I can relate to like feeling a bit quite disconnected from my cultural heritage. Um, like in school, I, I saw a lot of racism towards Chinese people and Indian people, no one liked them kind of vibe. That mm. was like the rhetoric I heard a lot. And so I really was like rejected that for a while, which um, was something like in my like really throughout my 20s I was like no I no I'm I'm proud of who I am and that there's so many different things that form my identity um and you know and I think having such a as you said like team community I have such like a beautiful vast community of friends from all different cultural backgrounds and I feel like we all I don't know I feel so at home in that um so um, does that answer the question? Yeah, but I going mean, I back know to it was kind of like a general, like pretty, pretty broad <laughs> question, but um, have those experiences like informed writing music or like your enthusiasm for music or, you know, just generally does that, do those things bleed into the way that you, you write music? Vin, do you have any thoughts on this or? Um, oh, sorry. <laughs> I don't think they do. Yeah. Okay. But my well, they obviously do. <laughs> you, you know, like but yeah, not no, no. <laughs> I know it's yeah. like. I don't know really how to answer this, but maybe music for me, the way that I can nourish my myself and my identity is probably by being in the community and teaching, workshopping like with Mad Proper Deadly or working on Little Yarns with, you know, that what that's doing. That I'm, in terms of my musical identity, it's much more, I'm more concerned with helping others and um, it's being more inward face, not like inward facing, but like it's not about my fucking me. Sure. Um, I, it, that's more important to me by yeah. a lot. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah, 
Right. Absolutely. Yeah. Tricky question, but uh, it I is. Like, but, <laughs> I, it, but it's good. It, it opens up some interesting avenues. But yeah, I, I don't. Yeah, I'm more concerned with helping others to kind of make me feel good. Yeah. God, God, that sounds terrible. Touching on similar notions of personal identity, and I guess in relation to cultural identity as well. Um, I'm conscious that it's now kind of in fashion to frame non-white artists in relation to their background, specifically, um, you know, in, often in articles written by the largely Anglo-centric music press and, and music industry, artists of colour are framed as, you know, First Nations artist or African-Australian producer or, um, you know, I'm sure in your case, Milan, as well, like prefacing your gender as well, like female songwriter, producer, you know, whereas um, male largely Anglo-Australian musicians just remain the sort of unprefaced default musician, you know. Um, do you feel pigeonholed by that, or do you think just generally it's a good thing that there's now more overt representation in the media? Mm. Yeah, I, I definitely like there being more representation is a good thing. I think there's, like, progress and there's momentum moving forward, but... I think it can depend on like the context of the article and how it's delivered. If there's more a substance within it, um, then like that makes sense. But also I feel like every artist has like a different approach to how they self identify and then like what might be like in their bio or whatever. Like f for example, my cultural heritage is in my bio, I believe, <laughs> um, as well as, in terms of the female producer aspect, um, I speak about it a lot. I suppose I almost promote that um, for the basis of inspiring and 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 well, starting conversations um, around why there is such a lack of diversity in those spaces of engineering and producing. Mm. Um, so I'm always, I'm talking about that a lot as well as like talking about the workshops and mentorship that you mentioned earlier, like, um, predominantly with like female identifying non-binary and, and women of color. Um, it's been uh, a focus of mine over the last, I don't know, five years or something, four or five years. Um, so it makes sense for that to be in my, um, in my press, because that's yeah, how okay. what, what I'm often talking about. So, I I don't particularly feel pigeonholed. Yeah. No. Okay. Sure. Have any of you got um, any thoughts on that? I mean, I agree. Yeah, representation matters. Yeah. Massively, it sucks that people or groups of people can uh, commodify, exploit uh, diversity. Yeah. But I think ultimately. It's important and it sucks that uh, we have to wait for the rest of the world to fucking grow up. But yes. it's that that representation is going to lead to um, like actual change, I think. Yeah. But uh, I would say that those, you know, like some of those terms, I guess, aren't are never a ceiling to your potential, you know? Like, what do, what do like, you mean like um, you know, like being a um, female producer or, a, you know, in, in that preface mm. is never like, um, I don't know, should never hold you back to... Should never hold you back, yeah. Yeah, and, al and also it shouldn't, um, like... Doesn't necessarily have to control the content you create. Yes. Okay. You know. Def yes, for sure. Um. And, and like, if there's not more to the article, it's not like the one thing that defines you. Yeah. It's like, yeah. and there's nothing else to say. You know, it's yeah. like, yeah. well, you know, yeah. like as long as there's some more substance there, and, yeah. and but care I as well. and care and but I know that like I think every individual artist has different feelings on that. You know, um, and and that and how they self-identify and what's, you know, in their, you know, their output. So I think that's that's the the care that 
journalism, I think, needs to take for mm. I- individuals as well. Mm. Yeah. Um, so thinking about the last 12 months where we've seen, uh, you know, a climate crisis visibly rear its head and a global pandemic and um, the social change that the Black Lives Matter and Me Too movements have been pushing for, it's been, you know, a pretty overwhelming time just to be anyone. Um, but how has the last year been for you and how has that translated into your relationship generally with music? Yeah, it's been, what a, what a year, 2020. Um, very overwhelming, you're completely right. Um, how has it translated into music? I, um, I actually recently did like a post about this because um, I feel very privileged and blessed. Like at the end of last year, I started therapy. I got my 10 free or heavily subsidized, it depends who you see, um, sessions, which are actually 20. They upped it to 20 this yeah, year. Yeah. Um, and I had therapy like throughout this year. And that was like very, very helpful for me. Um, and I'm very grateful to have had that because the, you know, the vibrational energy of the whole world has been like really low. And I think um, a lot of creatives in particular, like we open ourselves up to express things and channel things. And, and, and therefore I feel like we're very sensitive to energies. I'm definitely know so myself so I made sure of just as much self-care as I could and part of my self-care is going into the studio locking myself in my safe space and and you know sometimes creating sometimes not sometimes Mm. just being next to my instruments like I don't know you're like that sounds a bit lonely (laughs) and just like my it's guitar's like there. <laughs> sleep for like four hours. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. But it's how nice does it feel to be in, so in, in that environment? So comfy, and, yeah. and so lucky that we both have studios. Like, yeah. you know, I, every day I open that studio, I was just like, fuck, thank, like, thank, ev- thank God that I yeah. um, have this space. So I think Absolutely. it's, it's, I feel like I definitely um, took some time from creating, as we were saying before, like I, you know, do other musical things, maybe um, not necessarily write lyrics. It wasn't very inspiring for me necessarily for um, like a good chunk of this year. But I, yeah, I lost my train of thought. No, I think, um, <laughs> I mean, that that's like, you know, the, I feel like when the lockdown started, all these musicians were kind of like, this is going to be so productive. I'm going to yeah. release like an, an album, an EP. And then all of a sudden everyone realized that maybe it's an okay time to just put it on the back burner and just figure out if you're going, you know, how you're going. And like, yeah. How was it totally. for you, Vinny? How's like, you know, this year, how's that translated to music for you? Well, I've been working pretty hard. Maybe that's, I mean, I just had that thought with listening to um, you, Milan. Maybe it's like a coping mechanism with all the stress and things that are going on. But I've pretty much just put my own music on hold and, like, gone super hard the whole year just in my studio. And maybe that's just... Maybe it's just coincidental that I'm making music because all I actually want to do is just be in that room, you know? Yeah, and I think, but also music is such a form of release. It's so healing and, and like, so we're so fortunate as um, to have a creative medium to kind of work through things and, uh, right? I never really thought, I I definitely took it for granted until you said that that place. It's so important and I'm so lucky and blessed to have that. So, what's coming up next for both of you over the next few months, next year? What's what have you got coming up? I got um, this show in like two weeks, um, like full live band Today. show, December third. Yeah, it's sold out. So, <laughs> <laughs> I don't. I don't know if you were trying to promo yeah. it. Yeah. Oh, you want to come? Yeah. Oh, I, mean. <laughs> yeah. I, I, I sort you out. But um, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, so I'm really excited about that. Those, that's like the first time in ages I've done like a full live band. You know, it's it's a six piece or six piece, including me. Do I say that? Mm-hmm. Five piece, six piece. Um, 
Um, so I'm, yeah, that's like my big thing of the year. And I've got a cool. couple of other like events. I'm doing something with uh, Roland at the Powerhouse Museum for EMC oh, right. um, next week. And um, then I'm just like wrapping up some projects uh, in December and then time off. Cool. Yeah. Time off. <laughs> Time off. I like Love that it. sound of time off. Yeah. Yeah. yeah I'm going to have a holiday too. Yeah, I'm going nature. Yes. I'm going bush. That's yeah. the plan. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. What do I have? Going <laughs> yeah, yeah. What's um, coming up? Like next year kind of thing. I'm going to, I mean, I'm going to try and go to America. I know that's so fucked. <laughs> <laughs> but. <laughs> right, right now. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that's yeah, cool. I think so I what probably will go there. What? Do you want to do over there? Just work. Oh, just sessions. I've got. I mean, I was supposed to go there at the start of the year, and uh, my my part of my team is over there, so um, make songs with people. Yeah. Um, the Mad Proper Deadly EP Revive will come out soon. Cool. It's getting mixed now. And it's Great. Dope. I can't wait it's to hear so it. It's so fire. Um, which I'm excited about. What else? Got some cool songs coming out in the next month. Cool. Um, yeah. Your own songs or like collabs? Yeah. yeah. Collabs, yeah. Awesome. It's going to be pretty crazy. Damn. Well, um, yeah, thank you so much for making the time to to do this. Um, it's Yeah, it's been really, thank you. really great. This is mad. Great. Thank you. This is, yeah. this is heaps It's fun. been so interesting <laughs> um, just to hear you both talk about... Um, you know, some of your ideas behind songwriting and, and just your ideas about music generally. I, You've definitely reframed my perspective on quite a lot of things. So it's been a real, real pleasure. So thanks a lot. Thank, Thank you. you so much.